All right, so when we were making this guy's talk, um, it, what's really funny is uh, I'm a scientist, and, and we're working with scientists, and not my field. He's a marine biologist. This guy's gone all over the world collecting specimens from the bottom of the ocean. And we were sitting here trying to talk about biodiversity, the number of species, the different number of species on the planet. And what we started talking about is we had another speaker, Karen. Raise your hand. Karen, back here, is a former speaker, and she made my tie, actually. She, uh, she talks about the dark web. Did you know Google only can search about 13% of the known information on the internet? It's the best search engine on the planet, right? The most of the information is completely unsearchable. Talking with Chris, our first speaker, he talks about this concept called dark taxa. The idea that there's a lot of organisms that we don't even know exist. And if we do, how are they affecting the things that we do know? So he's here to tell us a little bit about how different all organisms are, what we're going to do about it, how he studies it, and how you guys are going to contribute to the biodiversity of this planet. So without further ado, I want to introduce, uh, with a thirst for diversity, Dr. Chris Meyer. Wait, i got to put my drink down. Thanks, Eric. Uh, wow. This is quite special to lead off this group. Uh, a lot of people out there, and this is a very exciting time. Um, I have to thank these guys for the patience. Sorry. They said they'd yell at me if I didn't hold the mic up, like, right there. Um, so we'll start right off. Uh, oops. Wow. So I'm going to tell a story about names, but it's really caged in the concept of diversity and dark tax, as Eric said. Uh, I'm at the Natural History Museum, and I'm a certified nerd, and I know that because my kid programmed my phone when I talk to Siri, it says, hello, water animal nerd. <laughs> I've also been called skinny little nerd by my sister-in-law, so it, I'm, I'm right there. So we're good. So diversity, dark tax, and a story about names. So biodiversity, if you don't know biodiversity, you know, we're not supposed to introduce too much jargon. But simply stated, biodiversity is kind of the variety of life, OK? And this isn't just the number of species, but it's variety at all levels of biological uh, organization. So from genes to organisms, population, species, or communities. That's biodiversity. You can calculate that. You can uh, characterize it. You can do whatever. But that's biodiversity in a nutshell. So we'll get that out of the way. And why should you care about biodiversity? So anybody play UNO out there? <laughs> right? OK, which hand do you want to start UNO with? Do you want hand number one? Or do you want hand number two? Why do we want two? It's more diverse. So basically, you can think about diversity in ecosystems or at whatever level. It's a hedge, right? It's a hedge for change. What if somebody changes it from red to green? What if the system changes? You want to have diversity. And clearly, UNO is a good analogy for that. So biodiversity is very important for us. And wow, slides are off a little bit. Sorry about this. So at the Smithsonian, at least. At the Natural History Museum, <laughs> diversities are business. OK, basically, this is what we do. This is we wake up every day. We, we're passionate about diversity. This is what this is kind of uh, this is what gets us. We have that collector gene. We've had it ever since we were born, and we never got rid of it. And we've been fortunate enough to make a living doing exactly this. And we have a lot of diversity in the Smithsonian. If you come back there and, and, and get a tour and you can come talk to me later, we could probably line something up. There's tons of diversity everywhere. That's our job. We are tasked to describe diversity and convey that and disseminate that knowledge and diffuse it out. That's, that's what we do day in, day out. So one of the things about biodiversity is really like the ultimate goal that we need to think about and why it's important to you is Really, we just we have to figure out what's the sufficient amount of biodiversity to keep us happy, right? To keep systems functioning. Clearly, there's probably a lot of biodiversity out there which we probably don't need. Uh, you know, I could say some controversial things here, but you know, there's some questions about whether diver all the diversity we need is or is it just baubles on a tree, etc. But really, diversity is what we. There's a certain amount we need. The problem is, is like how do you manage that stock if you have no idea of what your inventory is, right? So right now, we really don't know what the total uh, diversity is on this planet. And there's a lot of debate out there. And clearly, some assessment of that inventory is needed. So a project that I direct is called Moreo Biocode. It's a little island next to Tahiti. It's out in the middle of nowhere in the Central Pacific. And it's a prototype 
of an all species inventory. So we've been funded, the Moore Foundation has been very generous to the tune of about $5 million to let us go out and explore and try, it's like a global, well it's not global, it's a regional scavenger hunt. We have hundreds of scientists that are out there landing helicopters on the tops of the island, going down to the, de the depths of diving depths. And our, our job is to go find a di every different species we can on this entire e in this entire tropical ecosystem. And it's like a model ecosystem. Just like we didn't start sequencing the human genome straight up, we don't, we're not going to jump straight to the Brazilian rainforest or whatever. We're going to start with something manageable, but something that we think is representative. So it's a model ecosystem. We're trying to understand and document all that. And then the lessons learned we can take to a global center. So for the last five years, we've had, again, hundreds of scientists from 40 different nations going out and collecting diversity, both terrestrial and marine. And there's a lot of similarities between how they collect diversity. It's actually kind of amazing to sit up high and have this bird's eye view. You know, we black light and draw insects in. We also put lights out in the ocean and draw in with lighting at night. We do nets. You know, you butterfly nets, and we put out plankton nets, and we collect plankton. We put out traps and get things flying into traps. We, we lay out traps uh, out in the ocean and let things settle on them. So basically, all your traditional ways. In, in some ways, it's a very Victorian approach. We're out there doing what, what centuries of naturalists have done, collecting species, documenting them, putting them in, in museums and vouchering them, trying to figure out if we can collect all this diversity. And of course, you know, it comes back to the lab. We do a lot of photography. There's a lot of informatics. There's a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, but it's, it's pretty busy. We're up till 3 AM, getting up at 5 AM, not a lot of sleep. Uh, it's super fun, and it's, but it's not much of a vacation. And so how do we determine what we, and this is, gets to the names part, right? So why do, you know, we, we try and put names on everything we collect. And why do we use names? Well. It's a means of communication. We put it on a list, you write it on the list, oh, we got this species. But really, names are somewhat, uh, it's a label. And they're also kind of a hypothesis. Uh, I, I just showed one example here of a cowrie shell that I worked on. They're really beautiful and fun to work on. But I've changed this name. Names change all the time. And people hate when names change. If you're, the shell's worth, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks or something in a collector community. And when the name changes, then they got to change all their labels. People are furious at taxonomists like us who change names. But actually, and this isn't going to show up too well because it's going to be on the bottom, but the organisms actually, it turns out, carry their name around them because they, well, it's not going to help too much, I don't think. Maybe I could stand here and maybe, no, nah, it's not going to be all right. All right, so, but you carry your name with it because we all have a genetic code. And that information's digital, right? Everybody here, who doesn't know about genomes and genetics or this is, nobody, right? Everybody kind of gets it. And if you don't, you better because if you don't understand genetics, personalized medicine in this in the future, you're going to need to. So we all carry this genetic code, and we can decode that. And the data is already digital. We can take that name and basically use it as a tag to identify species. And so that's what we've been tasked to do. We're getting a genetic sequence, a barcode for every species that we're doing. So we take a little snippet. We found kind of like the Goldilocks gene. It has just enough variation, but not too much that it kind of identifies species. It's locked in the mitochondria in the cell, and we sequence that gene for every species. And we get a database of that in addition to all the other stuff we do. So we've gone around this island. We've, we've collected that information. Oops, seem to have lost. Oh. And this is kind of where we stand right now. We have, we've collected about 40,000 specimens. We have about, currently about, I don't know, because you can't see it. Who wants to guess how many species we have on this island? So, because you can't even see the scale bar there. That's good. This is perfect. This will work well. And we collect, you know, these are, it's all, how many species do you think are on this island of Morea? 400,000. You, if you're from the Smithsonian, you're not allowed to say anything. How many? Seven? How, million? We're in the millions? Wow, that's pretty good. 20,000. It's lower, actually. It's surprisingly, we have somewhere between 7,000 and 8,000 species across the diversity of groups here. So we've, we've been documenting that. We feel like we're doing a pretty good job of documenting that diversity because we're kind of running out of the big things as we go around. Now, we're only tasked to collect things that are large, that you can pick up with tweezers. Interesting point. We can get to that later. So we've run, we've run the scavenger hunt. We've gone out. We've, we've, we've done this. Uh, basically, we're doing a censusing event. We're going to everybody's driveway. We're checking out. 
what's in there. And basically, you think of that barcode as kind of the license plate, right? So we're, we're creating a phone book. We're creating a, a license plate registry of all the species in this ecosystem. But now the fun starts, because we can say, well, how well are we doing? So we're basically setting out these toll booths, or these gates, and we put a, a structure. This is, we call this an ARMS. It's an automated reef monitoring structure, because, well, we're not really allowed to say artificial, but it's automated works well. And we, basically, we go out there, we put it on the reef, we let it sit there for a full year, and it gr a bunch of stuff grow on it. And if you don't know, a lot of things that are sessile are actually animals. There's filter feeding animals that settle on this thing. So these are the plates. We take them apart and photograph them. And we put a, a mesh cage, a, a little milk crate on top, and we bring it up. We take the whole thing apart. And we analyze every single creature in that um, structure. And here I'm going to run a, oops, a little video. And actually, we don't bother to voucher it. And Matt's here, who's done a lot of this work. You can talk to him. We basically scrape the whole thing up into alcohol like this. We actually photo document, as you saw in the photos, and we put it into a blender. Okay, so here we are scraping smoothie. <laughs> it's reef in a blender. We blend it up, and then pour it in. Now we dared each other to drink this, and we decided it probably wouldn't be such a good idea. And we can extract the DNA from that entire reef. So there you've got little globs. This is a time when you can actually see the DNA. It's super coiled. This is DNA. You can actually grab it, hold it. We've extracted that. It's the entire community, that entire arm in that little nodule there. And then we can sequence it. We can make a library of all the license plates that were in that arm, OK? So we get a plot that looks something like this. Uh, of the number of, of sequences that we, we read in the library. And as you can see, it's still going up. We haven't sequenced enough. We're still climbing. In that one arm, just that scraped fraction had 700 species, OK? We've only documented between three and 4,000 on the entire island so far. So just in one deployment of one scraped fraction, we're already hitting, you know, what is that, 20%? Who's the math expert here? Um, somewhere in that ballpark. And that's just the scrape fraction. But what's really cool now is we can go and look at the database and we can say, all these sequences, how do they match what we have? We have the phone book, right? So we can look them up in the phone book and say, do we have this record? How well are we doing using the DNA? We're not using the name of a species. We're reducing it straight to the digital data that are recorded in the genomes of all these species, right? And we can look at that, and here, here's the arms data. And the black stuff is the dark taxa. We're missing somewhere on the ballpark of 60% of the diversity on those arms. We haven't collected in our voucher. And we felt pretty damn good about how we're doing. We only have about 30, 33% of the diversity from that arm. And we can do other things. We can let the animals tell us what's important in their system. Here's a bunch of fish. We can open up their guts, and we can do the same thing. We can look at the dryer lint that we get in the guts and sequence that up. Among these three, species, these three species of fish, there are 306 things in there. And again, we have less than half of them in our data set. And we can look at plankton toes, and we get a kind of the same perspective here. So basically, overall, how well are we doing? What are we batting? Well, we're batting 380. Not bad if you're you know, playing baseball. There's a lot of dark taxa. This is this level of dark species out there that exist. And the question is, you know, what, what are they doing? What are these unregistered drivers, basically? Who are they? What are they doing in the ecosystem? And that's the challenge, I think, in the future to figure out. So I'm going to stop here with a thought about where, oh, actually, one thing I want to say. So every single sample we've analyzed, there's one species in every single one of them. Every single one, no matter whether it's a plankton toe, no matter whether it's a fish gut, no matter whether it's an arm, you, you name it, myofauna, all this stuff. What, do you, what species is it? Human. We are in every single sample. We are everywhere, right? So you are. So we have a footprint everywhere we go. It's pretty impressive, actually. And actually, from a, you know, thinking about what that means to the environment, what is truly pristine, what is truly wilderness, the fact that we're there and collecting it, we've, we've altered those systems. So uh, I'm going to end here the, with my goal and you know, why I wake up. I want to basically democratize you know, um, 
the diversity, so we become a more bioliterate planet. I mean, I think we don't need to be sitting here concentrating on experts to do that. We, this, we're going to make, basically, there is Nanoport, Oxford Nanoport just released a little sequencer you can plug into your computer today. The technology is going to be there before we know it to do this kind of stuff day in, day out. And I think it's a very exciting time to think about how we adapt to that. So I'm going to end there. And let me, can I say something about the, the Absolutely not. dang it. So uh, because DNA is everywhere and it's very pervasive, I've convinced folks at Argonne National Lab who do Earth Microbiome Project there was a study that was done amongst the media folks at a press conference in Vancouver where they swabbed everybody's cell phones, and we had profiles of cell phones. I have 50 samples here. If you come up and find me, we're going to swab shoes and cell phones <laughs> and compare our data to Vancouver, Canada, and maybe we'll come back and talk about what those, what those look like. So find me. There's a little sheet. and We won't collect any personal information, but there's, there's, uh, we're going to do that throughout the evening. So. Find me. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Uh, very good. Do we, do we have any qu very quick questions for Chris? Because we're one. Oh, you were really excited. Okay, Dr. Meyer, you have like what, 60% of what you've been pulling out there is dark taxa. You're able to identify it as dark taxa because you can look at the genome and say this is different from the stuff we know. And you're able to say presumably some of this dark taxa is different from some of this other dark taxa. In other words, it's got a different fingerprint. With that information, why can't you go ahead and name something? Are you required to physically describe something before you can say we have an identity of a distinct species? Can I just yell? No. All right. So, so there are certain rules. There's this ICZN rule. There's some botany code. But you, there are certain rules about how you describe species. Uh, the bacterial code has gotten around that a little bit. But not really. They have to culture it and stuff like that. You have to have a voucher. Actually, stuff does get described without a voucher. Uh, you have to have some physical presence. So actually, it's, it's being debated right now. And people have described things based on just genetic sequence data. But it's been, it's been kind of a, uh, they're, they're being somewhat ostracized by doing that. But my attitude, and that's get at the name, is that actually, it shouldn't stop us from doing the science. And in fact, the, the concept of maybe an alternative naming scheme right now, because you can marry it up. It shouldn't slow us science down because we have this. You can, you can do them together. And every once in a while, when we get a voucher, we can make that ring, rung on the ladder work and hook it in. So I, I think we can definitely advance. We don't need the name to do those comparisons, to know whether it, you know, we have a hit in space and time. It shouldn't slow our science down, and it's not. So it's. At, is it like naming the stars? Uh, well, there's some th thought about you know putting these names out for bid and trying to generate funds for conservation or for whatever. That, it could happen, but um, there, there's definitely ways we can think about that. So, all right, give it up for Chris. So the best part about thirst is uh, they're gonna hang around. You can buy him a drink and tell him he's wrong. Or he can steal your DNA. <laughs>